So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Grijara Lal, the first batsman, scientist chef, National Center for Cell Science, Pune, India. Dr. Lal received his PhD degree from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He served as an assistant professor at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, New York City, USA, before returning to India in the year 2010. Lal's laboratory is interested in understanding the cellular and molecular mechanisms of immune tolerance. His laboratory is investigating the role of chemokine receptor signaling and neuroimmune communication in inflammation and autoimmunity. To his credit, he has more than 50 papers and presented his work in about 150 national and international meetings. He received several national and international awards, including the prestigious Ramalinga Swami Fellowship and the Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award from the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and Sarnajayanti Fellowship from the Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India. In fact, in the field, actually, I consider uh, Dr. Girijaralal as an Olympiad person, the second generation immunology and information expert. Over to Giri. Thank you, Dr. Bala Subramaniam, for a very nice introduction. Let me share my first slide. Um, I hope slide is visible. Yeah. Okay, very good. So let me start with thanking the society for having this work. Uh, I think this is very nice uh, series of things we are doing in for the community and for the society. And what I'm going to discuss today is the plasticity of T cell in pathophysiology of diseases. So we, in this lecture series, we have, we have seen lectures in different area, T cell and the innate immune cells, adaptive immune cells, What happened? You are not audible to me at least. Uh, specific subset of the T cells, the stem cells. Yeah. And uh, then from stem cells, you have a lot of cells differentiate, which we have innate immune cells and what we're going and then the lymphoid cells, but we have B cell, T cells, NK cell, and among the T cells, we have helper cell and cytotoxic T cells. So before we discuss the plasticity of these cells, I would like to discuss something on uh, where this matures. So in the basic immunology classes, we know that T cell mature in the thymus, the, the, they arrive from the stem cell from bone marrow, goes to thymus and their development of T cell takes place. And, and from there on, they, the, when they mature T cells move on to the peripheral system and differentiate into different cell types. So let me, before starting, let's look at the thymus and its history. So because T cell is closely associated with thymus whenever we talk in the immunology classes, and let's look at the evolution of the thymus, how we understand the biology of thymus and how it's a role. So if you look, go back and go back in 50s, uh, purpose of thymus having in the body was not known and just people were thinking it's a mysterious organ. And in fact, when, and when, cells, when people are performing surgery and when infants are dying, then they just blame it that the thymus was found in large and fertility was because of uh, uh, a big thymus rather than an aesthetics. And uh, they, what they had done, the removal of thymus controls the spontaneous or induced lymphocytic leukemia. So this is early days where the people are trying to understand what thymus contribute for it contribute for its existence. And if you have thymectomized baby mice, which was very, very poor survival. So the thymus at birth may be essential for the life. That's where thinking started, that you have to have thymus in order to survive. And then the Gleek in, let's look at 1956, what he has done, the testosterone impairs the development of Bursa Fabricius. As immunology student, you might be aware for the name B cell, which comes from this particular organ from the chicken, and which also serve as a thymus-like organ and produce antibody. And then later the gastro-nozzle 
first time showed in the mammal that there are recirculating lymphocytes and all those lymphocytes are very heterogeneous populations. And that is where it sees the cells involved in both cellular and molecular immunity. And in 1970, if you move on, then the new mice was discovered and they found that ethymic and immunodeficient mice. And uh, at that time, immunological function of thymus was not even questioned when, when they have found this, these mice. And, but the, the discovery came from uh, the Miller's laboratory from Australia, and they did very fantastic experiment, a very primitive, and you can imagine that the type of assay, plaque agar assay, that's a very classical assay. What was done is that to understand the, what happens in case of the, the thymus or the T cells that you take a mice and irradiate. So now essentially you kill all the bone marrow cells or uh, mo most of the immune cells and re-inject the bone marrow either from normal mice or from a F1 thymocyte lymphocytes, thymus lymphocyte. And if you do that and measure the antibody response produced in, this, in, the, in the mice uh, using the plaque agar assay. And if you just transfer F1 thymus lymphocyte, you have very poor antibody response. If you transfer in this irradiated mice activated F1 thymus lymphocyte, you have now got good antibody response. But if you use F1 thoracic duct lymphocyte, you have very good antibody response. So now you measuring the antibody response by transferring the thymocytes or the lymphocyte cells. Likewise, several experiments from Miller's lab was done and what was concluded from first time that thymus derived cells, now what we known as T cell, could be activated specifically by antigen and they are not precursor of antibody forming cell. They are they were essential for help via some other cell derived from, uh, derived from the bone marrow that is called as B cell to produce the antibody. Bursaf equivalent in the other species is the bone marrow. So like several paper published from his laboratory to conclude this, uh, these findings. And then when he went to present his work in one of the conference and he started discussing what is called as B cell and T cell, and obviously people uh, was not buying this because lymphocytes were homogeneous. So uh, the people definitely questioned does B cell and T cell population really exist? Or some people actually commented that Miller is just trying to, to give more importance to the first and last letter of the famous American word. Now, uh, so in that line, uh, after that, there are a lot of discovery and importance of T cell were given. Now we know that tolerance, memory, autoimmunity, immunodeficiency, energy, and a lot of other things, MSC restriction by Jinker a lot of other things, we, uh, the, the importance of T cell came and then uh, discovered. Now I'll go back to the, to the immunology or the T cell biology uh, in very early age. I will say the age of my student's time when I was a student, let's say in 1997, what we know that you have a nine T cells, they differentiate into Th1 or Th2, depending on the cytokine they have received. And these two cell types, they actually antagonize each other. So if you have Th1 cells, they actually inhibit the Th2 differentiation. And these helper cells, when they differentiate, they actually help a lot of cells like B cell, T cell, macrophages. Likewise, TS2 cells is known to help B cell and produce uh, and help in the production of antibody, mast cells, and TS2 response in the eosinophils and growth factor. So this was classical, very simple, linear, that you have night cell differentiating from TH1 and the TS2, that's what the T cell, and they, they block the function. Now move on with the time, then you come back here from 97 to 2006. Now you have two more cells added to it. So you have Th1, Th2, now Th17 and T regulatory T cells. And each one of these cells is marked by a specific transcription. That's what is known for is identification uh, in terms of transcription factor, which drives their differentiation and uh, the cytokine they secrete. Uh, so if, if you if you look at specifically each of one of these cytokines they produce, like TS2 produces IL-4, and the function of these particular T cells is given in the parasitic infection, allergy, or like TH1 cell, which is produced by, uh, which is when exposed to IL-12, uh, they differentiate into TH1 using these transcription factor, produce interferon gamma, and they are mostly responsible for 
uh, intercellular pathogens, uh, protection from the intercellular pathogens. Another cell type, TS17 and TREC, came in that time. Uh, uh, now these cells produce IL-17 and the TGF beta and IL-10 other factors are produced and they are contributing to autoimmunity or immunosuppression. Now moving ahead with the time, now what we had a linear even that, that is now looks more complex. And now what we have TH1, TS2, TS17, TREX, there are more cells and more complexity was added to this. Now you have TH9 cell and there are other cell types which are known. So the complexity went in such a way that these cells which were we're looking at in the linear pathway, they no longer now qualify. I mean, they do exist, their importance is there, but their plasticity in the tissue, in the, in the micro environment, that they can differentiate depending on what cytokine there, what cytokine combination they are exposed to, into uh, the, from one cell type to another, transiting to different subtype. And also not only they can, they are not terminally differentiated in the tissue, they, if they are exposed to the cytokine or combination of cytokine, they can come back to the different phenotype. So plasticity and polarization is guided by microenvironment. And then microenvironment, you have a lot of factors, including cytokines, which can come from innate immune cell or from adaptive immune cells, depending on what is there in the microenvironment. The cell, uh, when they differentiate secondary lymphoid organ as a specific cell type, they can go in periphery or in the microenvironment, in the peripheral organ, when they're exposed to the cytokine, they can also re-differentiate into other lineages depending on the cytokine. What here I'm showing is the transcription factor. If one transcription factor expressed is try to block others, and, and uh, likewise, there are other specific transcription factors. And these one of them try to drive the specific uh, uh, cell type, uh, if the specific cell type in the, in the tissue. Now, when it comes to the, the signaling pathway, we know that uh, there are different signaling pathways. Uh, there are surface extracellular sen sensing mechanism. You have TLR, uh, the T cell receptor, CD28, that's uh, the classical T cell activation marker. Signal from them actually goes through a lot of the signaling pathways. And some of these signaling pathways, they inhibit or promote depending on what they, they are exposed to. And now what I'm trying to show here, this is the signaling. Other than that, when cells mobilize from one location to other, they also exposed to different metabolic uh, microenvironment where the metabolic requirement at that particular location will be uh, availability of uh, those uh, uh, metabolites or requirement for those things are different in different tissues. Now the cell has to adopt. And if you study, uh, if you look at carefully, each one of these cells, like what we mentioned in TH1, TRA, TH17, they also adopt in a way that, that um, their metabolic requirement also changes. For example, let's say if we're talking about TH17 cells, they actually mostly use uh, the, they use mostly glycolysis pathway. And then you have TREX cells, which uses the different, the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. They use fatty acid pathway. So the, and all these things, these requirements are the, the, the controlled by different uh, transcription mechanism, different signaling. So we're not going to discuss more in detail, but what, what I wanted to point out that each one of these cell types are controlled, their plasticity is controlled, not only by these signals, any other signals coming from the, the outside, which can modulate some of these transcription factors and which can be shared. And accordingly, the cell can adopt Now, uh, the, as we advance in time, there are a lot of now needed the component involved with the microRNA. There are a lot of micro uh, microRNA is known, which also contribute in driving these cells in different uh, cell types, other than the classical transcription factor and the signal. So now, as we are moving with time, the complexity is increasing and, uh, to, and increasing, it's also good to understand the biology. It also, uh, help us, I will come back why actually it is more important to understand more, the more of this complexity. And it's sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, depending on the context, how we are looking at. Uh, for the, for understanding, sometimes the people, the students get confused with in terms of when we start talking about memory cells. 
So, and when we call the memory cells, then there are two types of memory cells actually comes in literature, the central memory T cells and effector memory T cells. And because we are uh, discussing the plasticity and also the T cell, I thought I will just discuss here what this central memory and effector memory are and how they are classified. It's better to understand. So uh, classically, when the, the T cells differentiate in the secondary lymphoid organ, so they can form any of the cell type. And when they become differentiated into memory cells, they have two things to do. One, either stay in the secondary lymphoid organ or go out. So in order for the cells to stay inside the secondary lymphoid organ for the purpose that if they require more to reproduce, uh, regenerate the, the similar antigen space memory cell, they should do that. To go outside, they have to go outside in order to fight the infection or for control the, the inflammation depending on the nature of the cell. So now that is where the definition of classical memory and the, the, the central memory and effector memory comes. So when cell decide to go out, so for them, they require a molecule that is uh, the chemokine receptor and cell adhesion molecule. So if they have to leave the organ, that means they should down-regulate a marker, a chemokine receptor, which is TCR7, and also less expression of this molecule that hold them inside the secondary lymphoid organ. So those memory cells, when they down-regulate these markers, they actually call as effector memory cells. When they decide to stay, they must hold the molecule, correct molecule in order to stay in the location, especially secondary lymphoid organ. So they have to have expressed high level of CD6 to 12, CCR7, uh, so these molecule phenotypically, if you identify memory cell by using this, you can define them what is their uh, what their phenotype, and then we can understand more biology. If they go in periphery, obviously they have to be equipped to fight the infection, and 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 uh, so so that's another property that the effector memory cells they have to be active at that time, and because they are staying in the secondary lymph organ, they have to have high potential of renewing so that they can seed whenever it is required. So I think that's what I wanted to point out that we, we should not get confused effector memory, central memory. Uh, just easy to remember that if they decide to stay, they must express right chemokine and like acceleration molecule. And also uh, what is their function? Based on that, you can distinguish them. Now we coming back to the plasticity we are talking about. And the plasticity is very, very vast. So now two ways. So we discussed several things that plasticity each one of these cells is specialized for a specific function. Each one of them has a secretion of a specific cytokine. How, and, and also we, their differentiation when we talk about, the, we know that classically the T-cell activation require TCR MSC, MSC interaction. In the TCR, there is something called variable region, CDR3, complementary determining region. And CDR3 decides that which antigen is going to interact. Now, what these people has done to understand that is the antigen interaction, how the plasticity or how the antigen interaction guides them to differentiation or which cell type actually have what kind of conservative PCR because that's where antigen is going to come in. Now, what they have done, so I was discussing you the, the cell coming from bone marrow, all the T cell comes from bone marrow. So there are two things comes out of the bone marrow, either natural T ray goes in periphery or the, the naive T cells. And once they go outside in the periphery, naive cell also has potential to difference into t -rex, or they can go to secondary lymphoid organ where they further differentiate depending on what cytokine is there. And likewise, in the periphery, they can acquire a lot of this phenotype what we discuss, like t -rex, TS-17, T follicular cell, TH1, TH2, TS-22. So likewise, I just want to point out TS-17, uh, TH-9, TS-35, uh, lot of other names comes in when you read literature, don't get confused. If you remember this TH-1, TH-2, rest others, what you can do to easy to remember these numbers. If I say TS-17, that means this cell will be secreting interleukin-17. If I say TS-22, the cell which we are discussing is secreting interleukin-22. Likewise, if I say TH9, that means interleukin 9 it is secreting. So it's easy to remember that number which is goes here other than these two, 
is actually producing the cytokine what they are, and that's why a lot of different investigators lab labeled it the, the name. Okay, coming back to the experiment to understand how PCR complexity is contributing to it, what these people have done, they have taken the blood, the peripheral blood from the healthy donor, and they have stained for all these markers, which they can, by surface staining, they can distinguish different population. Now, they, since you can distinguish, you can also isolate them, specifically purified population, a colonial population of each one of them. And you can just sequence the T-cell receptor, CDR3 region and then try to see if you look into different group, how they fall, or what is the diversity region and which might be contributing in the plasticity. Does they, one of these population have a specific CDR3 or highly conserved or highly diverse? That's the question they have asked using just by doing this method. So I will just to mention you, like we were discussing how they are purified. So you have cells which you can take out, get on the CD3 positive cell, CD4 positive cell, if you just be discussed that CCR7, which will mark for memory, exclude those memory cell. After that, you further get, you can get on C25 high and C127 low, which mark for Treg, and other cell type, which is uh, low and the CD127 positive. Among them, if you stain for these markers, you can actually segregate TFS, TH22, TH1, TH17, TH1 and TH17 type which is uh, TH1 like TH17 cell, TH2 are different cell types, depending on how. So it's a very complex flow cytometry study was done to purify these cells. And once you purify and sequence those TCR, CDR3 region, now ask question, how does CDR3 diversity? So there are a lot of other parameters that are considered, which I'm not going to discuss. Um, you can read more on this, but I wanted to point out, if you look at these cells, TFS cells, so highest diversity of CDR3, variability, uh, the plasticity in their variable region. And if you look at this green dot, which is TS2 and Treg, they have lowest diversity in terms of the TCR, uh, the CDR3 region. And if you look at among the clonotype they say, are, obviously there are a lot of cells and this variability. What it tells you that, that the somehow the complex nature of uh, the, CDR3, but how exactly it does, I think that's further we need to, to understand. There are some report, obviously, that uh, the how many antigen, how much in, antigenic stimulation one need, others doesn't need, uh, based on that. Now, we can actually also look at what these people has done in this study, that how closely their CDR3 regions is actually associated. So if you look at here in this graph, TH1, TH1, TH1 and TH17 type, are only TH17 type, they are clustering together. Likewise, there are other cell types, they are clustering in a specific group, but others are expressing the getting more connection to the TFS cells. What I wanted to point out, the plasticity begins probably from the TCR, and other than what these people are trying to say that in the, in the CDR3 regions, it self dictate what kind of cells is going to be, uh, or the, in the population dynamics, how they are going to behave, and then extracellular signalings direct them to, okay, go in, in a specific lineage. Now, I'm coming back to some specific uh, examples. I think we are going to study more. Dr. Sinikaver is going to talk about more of these cells, which is the regulatory T cells. So like we discussed, thymus, the uncommitted, the, the bone stem cells comes from the bone marrow. If they differentiate into a specific cell type, which is expressing transcription factor FOXP3, and these cells are called natural Treg. And there are cell types which actually move periphery cells and they express FOXP3 or they express some other molecules. So when they express FOXP3 in the, the, in the periphery, not in the thymus, they you call it as induced Treg or adaptive Treg uh, 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 in these cells. So essentially natural Treg and CD4 T cells, that's where they come out, obviously CD8. They also express FOXP3 or they don't express, but they also qualify, uh, have got some suppressive function other than their cytotoxic function. In the mucosal associated lymphoid tissues, when they are exposed to different micro, the cytokines or the, the in microenvironment, the T-Rex cells, other than these FOXP3, other cells can also produce different cytokines in anti-inflammatory cytokine. Now you have TR1, TS3, and FOXP3 positive induced T cells. So there are variety of suppressors, variety of ways suppressor cell can form, one which is the natural T-ray, 
other which is from peripheral T-ray, which is induced T-ray, other one which produce only IL-10, does not express FOX P3, you call them as TR1 cell, or TGA beta producing uh, the TS3, sometimes some administrator uh, name them. Now, what is the importance of these cells and how we understand the, 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 they are really suppressive? One example I'll take here. So here is a transplantation model, islet pancreatic islet trans, allogenic transplantation model. What is done here, you take the islet from the balsy mice and transplant at kidney capsule and then monitor what happened to the islet graft. If you don't do anything, then this graft will be rejected. And before doing the transplantation, you remove the existing graft by treating these mice with streptodosorcin, which is toxic for the existing islet graft. So now this mice become diabetic. And if you transplant the islet cells, now this mice will become uh, re recovered from the diabetes. And then as long as this graft are surviving, mice will be uh, the, the di diabetes free. And now, if you do that, and along with that, if you inject the regulatory T cells in that, so you get better survivability of graft. So that's how you measure that. T-Rex are one way to measure in transplantation the grafts are surviving. All right, so T-Rex are actually uh, the suppressor cells, but they are, not, they are circulating everywhere and they are exposed to different microenvironment. When they are exposed, obviously they have to respond to the microenvironment. One example, what we see, the, the classical example is their inflammatory molecules. One of them are toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptor like TLR4, LPS, more well-known ligand, and LPS is present in the system, is going to interact with TLR4. And, and also there are some intracellular ligand like uh, HMGB1, which produced by eukaryotic cell in our body. And when that is produced by stress cells, they also bind to TLR4 and uh, they contribute uh, in the cellular diversity. So what is done here to understand is that let's say you have an ongoing inflammation and you have a suppressor cell. And if, uh, if the transplantation is done from B6 mice to bulb C or B6 mice, which does and to bulb C, but this bulb C mice do not have TLR4. So what is the contribution of inflammatory signal in the recipient mice? Uh, so recipient mice, because immune cells are participating in the recipient uh, and I'll transplantation model. So obviously when you don't have TLR, you see better pro proliferation. You see the mice like bulb C to B6 and ask the same question, you better survivability. Now, if the mice do not have TLR and if you deplete the T-Rex from these and then ask question, what happened? The moment you deplete the T-Rex cells from here, now transplantation is, uh, rejected faster, much, much faster. What is suggesting that, that uh, the T-Rex actually TLR4 somehow contributing. And what then next was done is to figure out how these T-Rex are doing. So FOXP3, I mentioned to you, one of the transcription factor for the uh, regulatory T-cells. So naive T-cells was differentiated in presence of TGA beta and measured FOXP3 expression and plus or minus LPS. Now, what you see here is that if you have wild type mice or wild type T cells, which have TLR, when you give TGA beta, they differentiate into FOXP3 positive cells. But if you give them LPS along with TGA beta, they're no longer expressing FOXP3 or they're, they're expressing less. But same time, if the mice does not have TLR4, LPS is stopped working. And probably one way that there are a lot of more study done in this, that to show that the the, these inflammatory molecules can actually suppress the function of T-Rex both in vitro, in vivo, and may contribute in the, the disease model like transplantation. There are a lot of models also done with autoimmunity. There are several places the T-Rex is used. Another example I'll take from my lab is that uh, the T-cells migrate, migrate to using chemokine receptor. One of the chemokine receptors is CCR6. And in the gut inflammation, you have the epithelial cell produce a lot of CCL20 when, when there is inflammation in the gut. When these cells migrate using this chemokine and, and when T-Rex are actually uh, differentiating when this chemokine is present, their differentiation into T-Rex is hampered and their function is also hampered. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that the lot of Q plus, uh, the Cues come in the micro and present in the micro environment can change the plasticity or their differentiation function of one cell type into others. So that's where the signaling pathway can take place. So now you have another way, the chemokine, TLR, like other, a lot of other signaling molecules which can do that. 
So I was talking about T-Rex cells. Now there are some other pathogenic cell is TS-17 cell. We saw that there is an IP cell can differentiate into all these lineages. And because these lineages use a chemokine receptor to migrate from secondary lymphoid organ to the different place, it can be gut associated lymphoid organ in the gut using these chemokine ligands. When these ligands are present, they drive more pathogenic phenotype and also suppress the regulatory function. So the so so what is shown here is that uh, you have the the more pathogenic phenotype driven by a chemokine chemokine receptor, and uh, and suppression of the fun immune regulatory function is uh, also seen in these models. So it's good. Now I can also discuss something on central nervous system. So like same way you have IT cell, it's a central lymphoid organ. You can differentiate each one of these cell type, and they have to migrate to the brain where there is inflammation, especially if you have got, uh, if any, let's say, the central nervous uh, autoimmune disease in the central nervous system, T cells come into this microenvironment, depending on now what is there in the microenvironment, what kind of inflammation is there, these cells can differentiate into other lineages, or so they can acquire the more pathogenic phenotype in microenvironment, or they can lose their suppressive function depending on what is there in the, this tissue. So now I gave you the example in different tissues, depending on what is their microenvironment, they can differentiate and that can be guided by those, the, the cues present in the microenvironment. So what I'm trying to show here is that there are a lot of signals. There are a lot of signaling molecules. Some of them are there, some are unique, and they can actually talk to each one of these signaling and they can change the fate and fate of these cells and the function of the, the T cells. Now I will take another important cell, the regulatory CD8 T cells. Now it's getting more attention nowadays. And uh, the re reason for that, there are a lot of markers known for CD8 T cells to call them as regulatory T cells. Each one of them in unique cell, in, in, in unique tissue and model. So there is no any consensus that which one to choose that they call it as just like CD4, if we have FOXP3, we can always call them, okay, this is T8, but here, variety of cell type depending on the tissue, uh, the who has investigated, there are a lot of cells which comes as regulatory T cells. Now, among these cells, some of them, which is important, I, uh, I'll discuss in the model, where what is done is type one diabetes. In type one diabetes, you have the intestinal microbiota induced this CD8 positive, CD122 positive T-ray. And to understand that if these cells are actually suppressive, you can test this in the streptococcin induced diabetes model, which I explained to you. Instead of transplantation, if you transfer this, you can actually suppress. And patient also people has tried, uh, uh, what is known in that in type one diabetes patient, these cell population are less, these suppressive cells are less. And if you treat with probiotics, their number increase, uh, uh, that's what is reported in the clinic. Uh, in case of inflammatory bowel disease, IBDs, now you have uh, intestinal microbiota in the gut. They actually induce CD8 alpha alpha homodimer expressing CD4 T cells, and they act as a suppressor cells. So this has been tested in experimental colitis model that these cells if you transfer, you actually suppress it. In patient, if you look at uh, the celiac disease patient, they have less number in the, in the human patient. And if you give them probiotic, their number is known to restore. Other model like the graft versus host disease, you can see that uh, there is other cell type, which is regulatory like CD8 positive, CD45, uh, CD45 RC low, and uh, they can be expanded and they also have a suppressive function. Especially <coughs> if you have patient with allogenic bone marrow transplantation, they develop uh, GBSD, if it is allogenic, and if you do anti-CD45 RC therapy, so essentially you're blocking the, the promoting the expansion of these cells in vivo, which suppress the development of GBSD in the patient. Now, the coming back to what is the advantage of having so many plasticity and what is importance in terms of uh, its uses and uh, why nature should have it. So obviously, uh, the one thing which is benefit what we can see easily is that when you have inflammatory cells, you don't want really all the time inflammation to be going on because you have collateral damage. So after some time when damage is clear, they have to either move away from the site of inflammation 
or they differentiate into which is regulatory in nature best example ps17 cell they produce sometime il10 sometime they produce interferon gamma when they produce il10 same ts17 cells they are regulatory but when they producing interferon gamma they are pathogenic likewise there are other markers i just give one example so that's the advantage nature has created that you don't need to have all the time suppressor cells you can differentiate into inflammatory or if you have inflammatory you can come back to to regulatory markers depending on what is their nature what is the there in the microenvironment now the advantage what we can take in terms of immunotherapy we know that il6 is required for uh, differentiation of ps17 cells and if you block the il6 uh, best known nowadays molecule the tocilizumab what is going to do is blocking the ts17 and promoting now t reg differentiation so essentially you can control the inflammation uh inflammation of various type and low dose il2 we know that uh, low dose il2 promotes t reg and uh, that's the advantage we we have seen that example in the first time il2 was given to uh, to promote the inflammatory cell but the, in cancer model it works other way around so low dose of il2 also helps now essentially what we talking about switching the plasticity between this another example i can cite here tcr signaling strength a uh, different cell type require different pcr signaling strength and if you treat with ntcd3 depending on what chronotype they deplete a specific population but since we know that trex actually require not that much strong signal they are spared actually and that's why cd3 is used in type 1 diabetes um, uh, there are a lot of signaling molecules like jak inhibitors as immunosuppressant because they also block one way or other uh, different pathways mtor signaling rapamycin it promotes treg and induces tolerance we know that rapamycin is important in as immunosuppression and also uh, inhibition of pi pi3 kinase specifically uh, p100 delta selectively disrupt the treg and promote anti cancer immunity the treg is bad because you don't want to suppress more immunity in the cancer so anyway if you disrupt this it actually helps in mounting into tumor immunity so of na we were discussing that metabolic requirement so ts t rex cells actually uses more fatty acid pathway or oxidative phosphate oxidative phosphorylation pathway to generate energy now if you block this pathway actually you actually regulate the t rex and you promote uh, the 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 t17 pathway is switched metformin uh, that's again t follicular cells polarization and then uh, Uh, it actually promotes the follicular the regulatory t follicular regulatory t cells polarization over the inflammatory t follicular cells and that's why it's also used in some of the inflammatory diseases and to summarize here what i can say that naive t cells can differentiate into various subsets such as listed and what we discussed and these subset of immune cells are not terminally differentiated cell but so phenotypic and functional plasticity depending on the tissue and the microenvironment uh what is there in the microenvironment and, de- and depending on the tissue and microenvironment these cells can alter their its phenotype and function and understanding the difference details of cellular and molecular plasticity will help us to design better therapeutic strategy to control the inflammation and autoimmunity thank you so i will take a uh, question if you have some thank you giri for your excellent a to z overview on the history geography and science of t cells with a focus on their role in physiology and pathophysiology thank you very much thank you the talk is open for any discussion interactions uh, now I, i think this is dr chenchaker uh, it's one of the uh, issue that we look at when we are trying to use these drugs like uh, rapamycin or metformin I mean, is is there a way one can consider or think about when to use and when not to use it actually see that that's one of the biggest clinical questions we have uh, because metformin uh, these are all almost an approved drug for different indications so uh, how how exactly one can consider in repurposing them in auto right indication. so so i think the question uh, should be that how selective the drug are like are these drugs are going to work on immune cell or these drugs are going to work on non immune cells and how selectively they are going to act that's where the question the answer lies 
if a drug which is not targeting specifically the bad cell what what we want to get rid of they will have obviously lot of side effect and also the the strength of signal which is coming from that particular cell type or or that particular is uh, dominated by this the target what it is using if it is not then then we have to have uh, uh, we have to think of alternative so the question is that when to decide that what will work is the question that uh, how strength what is the strength of t cell plasticity uh, which you want to modulate Uh, you want to have general suppression, then you have a choice. Then you want to have a specific cell type suppression. If you have choice, and if you have presence of alternative to use it, I think that that's where the we need to take a call. I mean, I mean, just to uh, take it from the translational issues. If, for instance, we do have some of the patients of say rheumatoid or uh, say lupus, after giving a very moderate to high end immunosuppression, they come to a state. where they have a fluctuating course in a sense right. they go for a remission suddenly spurts up not too high to what it used to be beginning but they there is a flare and they shut down are they the best candidates where we can try this right so uh, we need to ask the question what was the origin of this why they developed lupus is it because of hyper immune response to begin with or the tissue in the microenvironment which was Uh, abruptly behaving and that's why the all other things came in picture including immune cells and they start damaging so by giving immunosuppression and target with the immunosuppression we can bring down the, the immune response but we need to figure out uh, what was the origin from where it begins and can we switch or somehow modulate that and the only question that we sometimes think is that is that regulatory cells are dysfunctioning to whatever we are hold back by using immunosuppression right so uh, is yeah there a, is there a way out to figure it out in a clinical scenario uh it's a challenging it's challenging um, so obviously the number need to go up the and the most important now problem is that how we increase the even regulatory t cell antigen specific regulatory t cell because if you just dump a lot of cells or okay, fine you can just like any immunosuppressive drug you can do it but can you have antigen specific uh, suppressor which can suppress only the immune cell which is required not the everything else thank you thank you gidari can i ask one question yes uh, my always like a uh, because host specific response is like uh, you know it's so diverse and some people like in case of covid we already see so when we say that this drug is like giving this much dose for this modulating t regulatory cell or th1 or whatever hmm. is it really like a is possible to say that this much dose will work for this but other one might be because that's the question chansegar uh, sir also asked because you know the dose might be different for different person if you define a host response for a person that this much of t cell imbalance is there then is possible you can give a specific dose but giving a uniform dose how much is it correct sometimes i feel like intra host diversity is so big all right so that's where actually we failed actually that's what mucor mycosis is now uh, how much you know suppression yes. was needed and how much was given yeah uh, so uh, likewise the how much antigen specific immunosuppression is needed uh, when we talk about specific immunotherapy mm -hmm. uh, i think that we need to still understand that part uh, in in individualized or personalized uh, treatment personalized. how much each one is required but the only thing is to really identify the normal level and <laughs> there is like a... <laughs> right yeah right yeah <laughs> the normal level in clinical is always a challenge for us <laughs> we we have done i think uh, last three years back about the balance of treg and th17 and can it predict the remission uh, in rheumatoid mm -hmm. what we found was disappointing none of them could really give a prediction for that yes yeah, that's so really good you can always say it's closer to normal level <laughs> yes <laughs>